working in sustainability communications for a little over 10 years now. When I first started, uh, it was a bit like wetting yourself whilst wearing a dark suit. Uh, no one noticed, but it gave you a warm feeling inside. Um, now, of course, we say it's like teenage sex. Uh, everyone says they're doing it, very few people actually are, uh, and those that are doing it are doing it quite badly. Um, these, are, these are really old jokes, but because I'm an environmentalist, I like to recycle them again. Uh, and I don't believe in inbuilt obsolescence in anything, um, let alone humour. Um, I want to talk to you today about sustainability as the reinvention of progress. Um, and Hannah's already intimated that I went around the world without flying. And while I was doing this trip, and this is me as my BA Baracus mode from the A-team, um, while I was doing this trip, it occurred to me that actually progress in the pace of travel had been interrupted. I was doing this slow and overland trip. Uh, I was travelling by bus, train, cargo ship, and the occasional belligerent camel. Um, this is the route that I took. And it struck me that once Concorde was retired, we'd suddenly taken a step back in the pace of travel. Progress wasn't a linear thing. We weren't constantly getting faster. And for the first time in 100 years, we'd probably taken a slight step back. And you have to hope when you do a journey like that and you go around the world without flying that the journey is the reward uh, because obviously your ultimate destination um, is the point from where you started from. And I, I believe actually this interruption of pro progress, certainly in the context of travel, might see the return of old technologies like airships, which are obviously far more environmentally efficient and could change the way that we get around the world. And this sort of leads me into this challenge that we face because we're living in an age of problems where everything feels so intractable and, and really difficult to unravel. So it's, it's climate change, swine flu, you know, global epidemics, financial crises, you name it, they're all wrapped up into this age of problems. Uh, and what we're trying to shift in terms of the context of progress is to move towards an age of solutions. And for me, that's all about sustainability, where we actually look at the social, economic and environmental in an indivisible way, not about crude trade-offs between one or the other, but actually this notion of clear indivisibility when we look at things in an integrated fashion. And this takes us beyond ideology, because progressive almost seems to have been tarnished in some political cultures, like progressive is somehow weak, liberal, ineffectual. Whereas the challenge we face in the world today is all about dynamic change. And actually, well, that's why we need to be progressive, because progressive is about creating a better place. Conservatism and I'm trying to get beyond political ideology here, is about maintaining the status quo. And that is simply not good enough in the world today. And so I love this kind of march of progress, you know, where we come down from the trees and we end up planting trees um, at the other end. But people take this idea of progress for granted. You know, and I think you know, we are living in a time in Western mature democracies where it's probably the best time ever to have lived. Your longevity, you're expected to live to at least 79 years old on average, your education, your opportunities for travel, uh, your, your, your gender equality, uh, your, your susceptibility to crime, all of these are about as good as they've ever been at any time in history. Um, and so it's easy for us to have faith in this idea of progress, but my argument is that that progress is conditional, and it's conditional on us keeping tabs on what is going on uh, around us. And I would argue that actually, Progress is not a linear thing. It's not a preordained, inevitable process. Actually, it's probably cyclical. And it's very easy for us to disrupt this process. Uh, and you know, we probably go through ebbs and flows and peaks and troughs if we take our eye off the ball. And let's get this straight. This is not about saving the planet. The planet will go on quite happily without us. It's really about saving ourselves. Uh, the environmental architect Michael Paulin tells a great joke about two planets walking along through space, uh, and one of them's scratching, itching, looking really uncomfortable. And the second planet turns around to him and says, What's up? He goes, You're really, really, really uncomfortable. He goes, I've got a terrible case of Homo sapiens. Um, <laughs> and the other planet turns around and goes, Don't worry, they'll be gone soon. Um, and so this is not about saving the planet. When people say, Oh, you tree huggers, you environmentalists, you're all about saving the planet. No, this is about saving our collective backsides. Um, and that's what should be galvanizing uh, and exciting us. And it's difficult because we live in a world of incredible complexity now. Uh, the interdependencies and the interconnectedness of the way that we live uh, is extraordinarily difficult to unpick. And there are many people who want to see the world in simplistic terms. And that's actually quite dangerous. I believe we have to get to a notion of simplicity beyond complexity. 
Uh, because simplicity, the right side of complexity is priceless. The wrong side of complexity is useless. And people who communicate or chat, try to tackle our challenges on a single issue type basis will inevitably come a cropper uh, and lead to failure. So we need to try and unpick this complexity. If you take this complexity as a barrier for change, we use it as an excuse. We say, oh, the world's so complicated. What difference can I possibly make? Because I don't understand what my role in it is and what difference I can achieve. And if you just take the simplest environmental behaviours that we might be expected to undertake personally, you start to see how this might take shape. Because we're all in the supermarket, we're not taking our plastic bags. Because that's a very visible, symbolic behaviour, which says I'm, I'm committed to environmental issues. Uh, and we may be doing our recycling at home. But when it comes to the big impact behaviours, the things which drive a coach of horses through your personal carbon footprint, they're the things we don't negotiate on. So I'm not giving that up, don't be crazy. Uh, and so our willingness to act is perversely, inversely proportional to the impact of those actions. So we all say we're committed, but actually the delivery of that commitment is actually not making the difference. The big, the big things with the big impacts are the things we're not prepared to give up. And that puts us in a difficult situation, particularly in the context of a wider cultural narrative. Because this is essentially the messaging which comes out in our quite happy market capitalist consumer economies. Uh, and every time we encounter some big societal challenge, uh, whether it's kind of uh, the 9-11 the bombings or other big economic crises, the first message which comes out from our political leaders is, get out there and keep shopping. Whatever you do, keep shopping, because that's how our economy sustains itself in its base. Or, or to put it more colloquially, you know, we have to buy more shit or we're all fucked. Uh, and and you know, this, unfortunately, is... It's a confusing message to be sending out there. And it encourages us to have these contradictions or to hold these internal contradictions in our heads. Uh, you even get kind of what I would call the greenwash marketing phenomenon uh, of trying to engage people on environmental issues. And this is one of the kind of archetypal examples. So you buy a low energy light bulb and you get given free air miles as a reward point. Um, and it's this type of perverse inconsistency uh, which helps to undermine our, our engagement with, with the issues and the challenges that we face. Or we get businesses saying, well, we're just going to rebrand. Uh, we're not actually going to change what we do. Uh, we're not actually going to alter our core business. We're just going to put a green, sustainable veneer uh, on our actions and activities. And this is really missing the big opportunity. I think it was one of the, the marketing directors from Nike who said, you have three options as a business in the 21st century. One is business as usual. Now that's probably not an option, given the resource crises and the environmental challenges we face. That's probably quite short term. The second option is to become more efficient at what you do. Now, you still hit the wall, you just hit the wall a little bit later. And the third option, and really the only viable option, is to evolve and innovate and change. Uh, and that should be the really kind of exciting, uh, demanding, cutting edge challenge. Uh, for businesses to get their teeth stuck into. Because otherwise, we end up in the progress trap. Now, it's, you don't have to spend long trying to consider or contemplate what this progress trap might constitute before you start to realise that issues like climate change and peak oil are, are exactly the embodiment of this trap. And that's where our striving for progress creates circumstances and conditions uh, and outputs which actually are undermining the potential for future progress. And I think we're caught in this kind of sweet spot, or perverse sweet spot, uh, where we're actually undermining our capacity to deliver future progress. And you, people like Jared Diamond have written very eloquently about how civilizations have collapsed before. Now the difference is, I think, for us, is that we are perhaps more aware than at any other point in history exactly the circumstances in which we find ourselves. We should have the foresight and we should have the evidence to be able to act intelligently and proactively and creatively to solve our sustainability challenges. But are we? And I think this, if you like, is the crux. Because we're kind of in denial. We kind of have all of this evidence in front of us uh, and we're sort of sticking our fingers in our ears and going, la la la, I don't really want to listen to that. That's all a bit difficult. I've got my own immediate pressing concerns. I just want to get on with my life. Um, and I think this is missing. Um, an enormous opportunity. And it's not a wonder we get caught in this progress trap because we've framed the world the wrong way round. We've put the economy on the outside and we say, well, the economy is the big thing we must consider at first. 
That's the thing which must drive all our decision making. And actually we need to flip that around completely. The economy is at the heart of what we do, but the environment is the ultimate bottom line, is the ultimate context. And we've even got the evidence for that through the Stern Review on the Economics of Climate Change, and Pavan Sukhdev's work on the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity, where we know the cost of action now is less than the cost of acting in the future, and the value of the ecosystem services that the natural world provides to us are worth trillions, absolutely trillions. So we need to reframe um, our perception and the way that we manage our decisions in the economy, because ultimately, even if you disagree with the drivers, of what should be this sustainable progress, you cannot disagree with the outcomes. So even, as this cartoon so eloquently illustrates, you don't believe in climate change. The outcomes of sustainability, green jobs, livable cities, renewable energy, energy security, are all incredibly compelling. You know, they should be the things that excite us, because the outcomes are right, regardless of what the drivers uh, for that change might be. And people say, well, can we afford all of that? That sounds a bit expensive. Well, Global wealth is currently $195 trillion. Now that's a vast amount of money. Now I don't know about you, but I find it quite hard to comprehend numbers with 12 zeros after them. So let's put it in a kind of context of time. Uh, and so 1 million seconds is about 12 days. A billion seconds is 31 years. So that's quite a step up, 12 days, 31 years. A trillion seconds is 31,688 years. That's how big these numbers get. That's how rich we are collectively. Um, and, but just to put that in context, you know, 31,000 years ago, Neanderthals were walking around in Europe. Um, that's how long ago it was. So why is that relevant? Well, the reason that's relevant is that $195 trillion is a vast amount of wealth. But there's a champagne glass distribution. Um, it's a nice visual metaphor, but basically all the money's at the top, in the, in the top 20% of the population. Now, if you divide that $195 trillion per capita, we get about $50,000 each, which isn't bad considering about a billion people in the world have assets of less than a thousand dollars. But the reason all this is important is because if we are to drive creative, innovative solutions, equality and equity really matters. And I'm speaking to a Scandinavian audience here, so you will relate to this, but more equal societies, societies are more innovative. They will drive the change. And if you look at the economic inequality across the bottom here, the high income inequality nations like USA, Portugal, even the UK, very low innovation, low number of patents. And it's no surprise to find Finland, Sweden and Norway at the top left-hand corner of that graph. More equal societies are more creative and innovative in driving change. And that's enormously important if we're to find solutions for sustainability and progress. And when we talk about these issues, this most exciting dynamic sustainability challenge, we, we preach to people. You know, we say, don't do this. We get holier than thou, we get sanctimonious. Or we make it unnecessarily complicated. You know, we befuddle people and confuse them and, and give them multiple mixed messages. Or, or we get passive aggressive. You know, this recycling poster which says, some poor misguided soul. You know, we get, we get a little bit narky. It's not surprising because we get frustrated. But, or we get boring. You know, and we just turn what should be the most dynamic, exciting challenge into something really dull and dry. Um, our other tool is to kind of scare people into action, to create images of Armageddon or apocalypse. Um, and the trouble is we, we create fear without agency, a sense of agency of what people are expected to do, what they can contribute and how they can make a difference. Uh, and it's, it's really scary. We talk about climate change, we say the biggest collective challenge we've ever cumulatively faced. Uh, by the way, swap a few light bulbs, half a billion kettle, you know, don't use the car on Saturday and everything will be fine. And people don't buy that. The scale of the solution must match the scale of the challenge. And we also suffer from the bystander effect. The bystander effect says, if you fall over and hurt yourself in the street, you better hope there's only one person there to help you. Because so if there's one person there, they'll step in and think, oh, he's fallen over in the street, I'll give him a hand. If there's a whole crowd, everyone looks at each other and says, he's fallen over in the street, I really hope someone else goes and helps him. Uh, and this is the problem, because on sustainability, we all go, such a huge challenge, someone must be doing something about this, right? Uh, oh gee, that's us. Um, so how do, how do we galvanise action? How do we get people involved? Well, one of the ways of doing this, and to take it beyond political ideology that so often traps us, uh, or becomes divisive amongst the audiences we're trying to reach, we, we divide people up. And there's a classic values mode um, distribution done by a guy called Pat Day in his organisation Cultural Dynamics, and splits us up into three chunks. 
You know, we have the, like the red brick chunk, the settlers, who are very security and sustenance driven, worry about their immediate um, locality and environment and lifestyle. Then you have the gold chunk, the prospectors, the people who are very outer directed, driven by status, success, and aspiration. Um, and then finally, the kind of the pioneers chunk, which I'm assuming is a lot of people in the room here, but people who are inner directed about ethical concerns and discovering new things. Now, that's important because that mix of people means you would push or promote or try to communicate issues in a very, very different way, depending on who you were talking to. So let's say, and this is a Tesla, but let's say we were trying to push a more prosaic electric vehicle, like the Nissan Leaf. Um, but if you were trying to get this to a settler, you'd be talking about fuel efficiency, reliability, you know, local impacts. If you're trying to sell it to a prospector, you'd be talking about the electric smile. You know, the electric smile you get when you get that quiet acceleration. Uh, or the fact that it's sexy, it's cool, it's very cutting edge. Um, and for a pioneer, you'd be talking about the low carbon aspect, you know, the fact that it's clean fuel, it's very renewable energy, and all those kind of things. So you frame the arguments in different ways, and that's the way we build a big movement, by tapping in to the values that people already hold, and we change their behaviours rather than trying to change the people. And we have to be optimistic about this. If we're not optimistic about whether we can achieve sustainability, then we are setting ourselves up to fail. Uh, and I love the quote which says, um, if... Even if you're wrong at the end of the day, at least you'd have been happy uh, while you've been working. Because if we're pessimists, we'll all get very depressed uh, along the way. And it's really about selling the sizzle. And what the sizzle is, is it takes, take it from an American hot dog salesman. who says, when you're trying to sell a hot dog, you're not selling the hot dog. You're selling the smell, the aroma, the sound of the, the sausage cooking in the pan. Uh, and if you're not selling that, you're selling a dead pig. Um, <laughs> and essentially, what we're trying to do is capture this vision of a low carbon, positive, sustainable future, which will galvanize and capture the imagination of people, because that's where we're going. And it's not about keeping calm and carrying on. This is a famous poster from the Second World War in the UK, when we thought we were about to be invaded by the Nazis. And this was the poster that we we're going to put up. This is not about keeping calm and carrying on. This is about getting excited and changing things. Because ultimately, this is a unique moment to be alive. And I, I take this quote as my concluding comment from Buckminster Fuller, who said, think of it. We are blessed with technology that would be indescribable to our forefathers. We have the wherewithal, the know-it-all, to feed everybody, clothe everybody, and give every human on earth a chance. We know now what we could never have known before, that we now have an option for all humanity to make it successfully on this planet in this lifetime. But whether it's to be utopia or oblivion will be a touch-and-go relay race to the final moment. I think this is an incredibly empowering time. And I think if we put sustainability at the heart of progress, we might just check to the world. Thank you very much. Woo!